Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I just, uh, and thanks for the witnesses. I just want to say the administration's energy policies are not practical and, frankly, not doable, and everybody knows it. Uh, Secretary Granholm kind of proved that herself by trying to take an electric car across America, and you saw the result of that. Um, without the current, without any infrastructure in place, even after months of planning, imagine a citizen in Sullivan County, Indiana, without the benefit of a whole cadre of staffers planning their trip to try to travel to grandma's house in a state, in a nearby state with the current infrastructure in place. So it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. I have to say this hearing is time, Timely for my constituents, increasing electrical bills are starting to create some real concerns within communities across the Hoosier State and at drawing attention to the media. Just in the last week, I've read several articles in state publications discussing rising costs, real world concerns. While the cost of electricity has risen 19% nationwide since 2012, it's risen 35% in Indiana. And part of that is, is we depend on coal in Indiana. The short term answer is that producers have been forced to move away from that an affordable and locally available source of energy to alternative sources when there isn't yet the proper infrastructure in place to do so. I'm not gonna argue the merits of coal versus other sources of energy. Every energy source, as we know, has pros and cons, which I'm very familiar, and I'm, I believe in an all of the above approach. In fact, last week I spent uh, touring and learning about some of the energy production sites across my district from a coal mine to a hydro-powered dam on the Ohio River. We discussed wind, solar, natural gas. I heard firsthand from, from the industry that a rush to green agenda is coming with an unsustainable price tag, which means higher bills for my constituents. I support diversification of energy supplies, but we cannot put policy before practicality. Affordable energy and reliable energy is the key. Um, what I can't seem to figure out is the disconnect between the administration's Department of Energy priorities and the actual real world experiences of everyday Americans, particularly in my district. Over and over again, you put rules that, put out rules that fail to consider practical realities. For example, implementing standards on coal-fired power plants with unrealistic deadlines that force closures within a few short years. I understand that, that people want to get rid of coal, but we have to have other infrastructure in place to replace it. We don't. For all these reasons, I'm pleased to see that the GRID Act would ensure that federal agencies cannot finalize regulations that are likely to have a significant negative impact on the reliability of our bulk power system without considering and responding to input from FERC and the re relevant electrical reliability organization on such reliability impacts. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, uh, I'm gonna ch ch change subjects here, but I'm uh, a little bit, um, I was recently in, in North Carolina where they had the, the um, for a field hearing where they had a, a shutdown because transformers were attacked by what is considered, I think, domestic terrorism. So what can you give me real specific, and then I was subsequently, let me just say this, I was at Centerpoint Energy in Houston, and we're talking with them about their large transformers and what would happen if something went down to one of their ones that uh, roughly two million people would lose power. And they said it would take two years to replace it with the current supply chain situation we're in. So can you, are there any real specific examples of what DOE is doing to strengthen and diversify the supply chain for distribution transformers since we only have one company left producing electrical steel in the United States? Are there things we're, can, we're doing actively to, to, to support this? Yes, sir. Let me start with the pocketbook issues first. There's, uh, uh, $10 million uh, in rebates for more efficient transformers on the on market right now, $10 billion in 48C tax credits. That's, that's foundational. The, the, the things that we're doing out of my office as we speak are, again, I talked about this collaboration. Uh, it's probably been done before, but I do not know of uh, a, a collaboration that has been more congenial and more focused than the one we have right now with the power sector to try to find ways to ensure that we can improve the ability of uh, the, the manufacturer's existing capacity to meet the needs of the utilities today. And some of that means changing standards, et cetera. Sure. Uh, the other part of that is the longer term view, as I, I referenced earlier. We can't just keep uh, treading water and fixing this problem right. over and over again. So we're working on design solutions that use uh, more readily available products and materials 
that can be sourced right here okay. in America to build transformers of the future. May, may I say I'm one kinda, last word? Flex. Yeah, I'm, I'm out of time, but. Oh, I'm sorry, go, go right ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to get this in. I mean, for example, the city of Washington, Indiana, in my district, shared how the supply chain issues have delayed or even prohibited new housing developments, infrastructure upgrades, and the community's overall growth because of this issue, uh, of transformers, and the supply chain issues. So uh, I, I'm happy to hear that you're working collaboratively with the industry to solve this problem. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, Thank time's you very expired. Much. I'll now go to Texas, Mr.